Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is mastering engineer Ian Shepard. But first of all, let's talk about Facebook. We're going to talk specifically about Facebook video and then Facebook audio, because there's a few interesting developments that happened this week. The first thing is the news that comes about Facebook video. Now, it's really taking off at 8 billion views per day. That's right, 8 billion with a B, 8 billion views per day. But the interesting part is that people watch about 85% of them with the sound off. Now, obviously, that's not good for music video because (laughs) it's not a video medium. As many people think, it's actually an audio medium. People watch music videos mostly for the audio and not as much for the video portion of it. So it's defeating the whole purpose of actually releasing a video, a music video, on Facebook. Now, the way Facebook videos really work is they're set up more for advertisers. So what ends up happening is the advertiser actually gets charged if someone looks at the video, at a video ad, for three seconds or 10 seconds. And it's way different from YouTube. On YouTube, what ends up happening is you have to watch the whole ad, regardless how long it is, in order for the advertiser to get charged for it. The other thing that's also interesting about Facebook videos is that a music video, for instance, gets charges of you if you look at it for a second or two seconds. You don't have to watch it much at all, and it becomes charges of you, even though you probably didn't really look at it. With YouTube, it's way different. The criteria basically is you have to watch it for 31 seconds before it gets credited as a view. So when we see this figure of 8 billion views per day, that's kind of blown out of proportion. We're not talking apples to apples here. It's definitely apples and oranges when it comes to Facebook videos and YouTube videos. So be aware that when you place a video on Facebook, most likely people are going to watch it without having the sound on. If you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. Don't forget about my new Brand Your Music Crash Course, as well as my 101 Mixing Tricks program and other online video courses. Go to bobbyosinskicourses.com to learn more. One other thing about Facebook is this past week, it got into virtual reality really big time here. First of all, it bought a company called Two Big Ears. And what was significant about that is Two Big Ears has been working in virtual reality since about 2013 and had developed a very interesting toolkit. So now Facebook turns around and buys Two Big Ears with its toolkit and then turns around and offers that toolkit for free. It's called the Facebook 360 Spatial Workstation. Facebook 360 is the virtual reality portion of Facebook. So the Spatial Workstation actually has five components. The first one is called the FB360 Spatializer Plugin. And what this amounts to is a 360 degree virtual panner. Very cool. The next component is the FB360 Control Plugin. And this communicates with the VR player. And this is significant because the third component is the VR video player. And that's one of the things that makes this toolkit very unique because one of the most difficult things is actually playing back virtual reality video against the audio and having it sync up. So now this toolkit actually brings a way for that to happen easily. So that's the third thing, the VR video player. The fourth component is the FB360 encoder, which is also interesting because what this will do is it will encode the audio in an accepted virtual reality file format. Again, something very unique. So now you don't have to go to a third party and actually try to put the audio together with the video. And of course, the last part is what they call the FB360 audio engine. And what this will do is it will synchronize the head tracking info from the headset. Now, of course, when you're mixing, you're mixing on a headset. So this will now synchronize that tracking to the audio and to the picture. Now, since Facebook owns Oculus, and Oculus is one of the big VR headset makers, This is actually very interesting because now this headset works only with Oculus. Word is that eventually it's going to work with all the other headsets as well, but for now it's just Oculus. There's also another caveat here. It only works with three workstations, 
Pro Tools, which of course is kind of a given, you'd expect that. Reaper, which is very interesting. Reaper is a very cool yet inexpensive DAW. A lot of people really like. And finally, Nuendo. And Nuendo, of course, is very powerful. It's been around for a long time. And it almost took over post-production from Pro Tools a few years ago. What kind of stopped that whole thing was the fact that just about the time they're making headway, a major headway in Hollywood anyway, all of a sudden Steinberg, which develops Nuendo, was purchased by Yamaha. And that kind of stopped the whole thing. So if you have one of these three workstations, Pro Tools, Reaper, or Nuendo, you can download the Facebook 360 Spatial Workstation and there you go. You're on the way to mixing virtual reality. And again, it's free. So that's the best part of this whole thing. You have a package of great tools all for free. And as I told you many times here before, virtual reality is going to be the next big thing in audio. So this is a way to get into it virtually free if you have one of those workstations. My guest today is mastering engineer Ian Shepard, who's been a champion for bringing back dynamics and music and is the founder of Dynamic Range Day. Ian also has a number of books, courses, and a mastering podcast that are filled with useful information. He also designed the very cool Perception plugin to help find the loudness sweet spot in your music. I spoke with Ian via Skype from his studio in the UK. How did you become a mastering engineer? Is that something you always wanted to be? No, I didn't know what it was. Because <laughs> um, I, I was unusual. I actually, um, I was trained as a mastering engineer pretty much straight out of college. So I did physics and music at university. Um, and I, I left there and very soon got a, uh, managed to kind of worm my way into a little studio around the corner from where my parents worked and just uh, lived and worked for free there. Um, and I sent out a ton of letters to, you know, all the studios I could find in the white book, um, which is the UK kind of Bible of recording studios at the time. Um, and I got this one letter back from, or I got a phone call from a company that as far as I was concerned, were doing cassette duplication. Um, but they were near Cambridge, which was a, the city where I met my wife and which we both loved. So, um, you know, I was kind of curious and it turned out that they were not only doing cassette duplication, but they were one of the, the leading UK independent mastering houses. Um, and so I, I, I got a job there and I was trained up by um, Dave Richardson, who ran the studio at that time, and Nick Watson, who now runs Fluid Mastering in London. Hmm. And yeah, so I was a mastering engineer from the outset, whereas most mastering engineers, I think, start off as either recording or mixing engineers and maybe come to it later on in their career. Um, so yeah, at that point, I had no idea what it was. Um, you know, I just kind of, and I was trained from the ground up. So it was, I mean, it was a great experience, actually. Did you want to be a recording engineer prior to that? Oh yeah, um, I. So I did. What did I do? I left school. I just did. I did the the sciences and maths when I was at school. And by the time I, because we have a qualification here in the UK that we take when you're 18, called or they're A levels. You take three or four subjects at A level. And I got kind of down in the dumps at that point because I. I knew that I didn't want to be a professional scientist and I had I had really got into my music at that point and I just kind of felt like well what am I going to do and my parents said well look take another year do some more qualifications in music and then decide what you want to do so I did an extra year in Cambridge at the technical college there um it was double music um and I kind of got depressed or not depressed but down in the dumps again halfway through that because uh I knew that I didn't want to be a professional scientist, but I knew that I wasn't good enough to be a professional musician. Um, at, but at the same time, I was spending all my free time in the little recording studio they had there. You know, they had an early MIDI setup and, uh, you know, a DAT recorder and maybe they might have had a 16 track analog tape machine, I guess. So I was just playing with all of that. And somewhere along there, it kind of occurred to me, oh, I could work in a studio. Hmm. And from then on, it was just my goal, you know, um, that was my, and so I did physics and music at university, which, you know, these days you have all of these, uh, music technology courses, which would, would have been perfect for me. Um, but at the time there were, there were only two or three courses like that in the UK. Um, so I did this one that was literally, it was kind of 50%, um, 
quantum mechanics, you know, and hardcore physics and 50 percent uh, harmonizing Bach chorales and, you know, history of music and learning about Beethoven and Stockhausen and all the rest of it. And in the, my free time there, I was using the acoustics department in the physics uh, facility had a recording studio. In fact, they had a purpose built recording studio, which was fantastic. It was finished in my second year. Um, but unfortunately, the builders misunderstood the the plans and they concreted in the cable ties. <laughs> <laughs> so for the, for the whole time that I was there, we had, you know, it was triple glazed doors, a custom built studio, all this stuff. And we had the wires just going through the gaps in the, you know, in, in the glass doors. It was <laughs> kind of ridiculous. But I mean, that was great because they had some classic microphones. You know, the, the kind of the acoustics department started out in the 60s and 70s. I learned how to splice analog tape. Um, they had a, a Synthi 1000, which is kind of like a VCS3, you know, the old analog synthesizers that Pink Floyd and everybody used, but kind of took up the entire wall of one room. And I think there were only like a handful of those in the world. Um, so yeah, it, and I recorded um, an album for some friends of mine on a Tascam eight track cassette Porter studio, um, which was kind of cutting edge in the, you know, in the, the low end of the, uh, the market in those days. I remember those, yeah. In fact, there was just, uh, I'm in a Facebook group of, of recording engineers um, and uh, somebody posted, there was a little thread recently about, you know, what was your first tape machine? And yeah, all of these four track Tascams came out. It was, uh, <laughs> it was pretty funny. Very cool. Yeah, mine was a uh, four track reel to reel was a decoder, which was basically oh, okay. a, a poor man's Tascam 3340. Is that what it was? Yeah. Anyway, that was my first one. Okay. Well, I mean, so th that was kind of it. I mean, I... So I also, when I was at university, um, I worked on the live sound crew there. So um, I did monitor sound and I did front of house occasionally. And, you know, I learned to mic up guitar cabs and mic up a drum kit and plug up a PA and all of that kind of invaluable stuff, really. Um, Soundcraft did uh, a kind of mixing weekend. I went off and did that as kind of, you know, that was one of the perks of, of being on the, the crew. And I... Uh, they used to call it humping, you know, where you put the stage up and take it down for for the the big bands who would play in the in the university union. So, um, you know, I did that for I did an all nighter at Cardiff Arena for Kiss, um, and oh, I don't know, I was I loved my uh, electronica back then. So I did, I worked on the the gigs at the Orb and Orbital and Utah Saints and a load of kind of nineties crossover dance acts. Did oh, I had a great time, loved it, and sort of straight out of that, really, I got the job at SRT and got trained up as a mastering engineer. So how long did it take you as an apprentice until you felt like you had a pretty good handle on it? <laughs> I was I was pretty cocky. Um, I thought I had a handle on it from pretty much from the get go. Um, I didn't, you know, it took, um, I, th I think maybe a year or two minimum before, with hindsight, I, I was really kind of I would always get there in the end. I mean, I actually was lucky enough to find the second CD I ever mastered professionally um, on eBay. No, I tell a lie. It came from the guy from the guy who runs the record company that was released by. Um, it was by. It was a live album for the Au Pairs, um, and I, I kind of, you know, I put it <laughs> on my CD player with kind of fear and dread, but <laughs> it sounded pretty good. Um, you know, I mean, it should have. I was working in a professional mastering studio. I had BMW 801s as monitoring. I had what then was top of the line gear. Um, and everything I did was checked by somebody else. You know, um, in fact, um, I, you remember back in those days, the first CD masters went to Umatic tape, those big old video cartridges. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, the whole setup with the Umatic tape and the analyzer and all the rest of it, I mean, it was hundreds of thousands of pounds. So there were only two in the company. There were five studios, but there were only two of those machines. So everything I did, I, I actually mastered to DAT. And then the DAT was taken into another studio, copied across to Umatic by another engineer and PQ encoded afterwards. Um, so everything I did got listened to by somebody who knew, knew what, better what they were doing than I did. Um, and, you know, I just got great feedback that way because some of the jobs were like, yeah, this is great. That's fine. And then others, it was like, no, you need to think again about, you know, these things. Um so yeah, I I think at least several years, I would I would say I, I felt I was doing great all that time, um, but uh, yeah, I think I was maybe a little bit naive. 
So you really do have a well-rounded background between the physics background, which so few of us in the music business have, to a well-rounded music background. And again, a lot of us have a music background, but maybe not as deep as yours. And then working as an apprentice with some really good people. And again, that, that's not something that everybody has the opportunity to do. So that's led you to where you are today. It certainly has. I've been very lucky. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, over the course of my career, a whole load of things in terms of timing um, and just, you know, moves that I made have, have been lucky. Um, well, like what? Well, I mean, most recently, I would say the internet, you know, the fact that I kind of learned about blogging back in, uh, what was it, 2008 um, yeah. and decided to give it a try just more or less for the fun of it. You know, that kind of started me on the route to, to now having the website. Um, I mean, in I was lucky at SRT. I mean, I, th I think being a mastering engineer is a great job anyway, because you I'm not patient enough to be a recording or even probably a, a professional mix engineer. I've done recording and mixing and I, I love it. I enjoy it. But the thing I love about mastering is usually you spend no more than a day working on a project. You know, you might have some revisions at another time. And at some points I was doing two albums a day. Um, so the variety is fantastic. And, you know, you just kind of, it's, it's, it's the fun bit because you come in and you just pull the whole thing together and make it sound great. Um, and then you move on to the, to the next bit um, without any of the kind of months of, you know, pain setting up drum sounds and all that kind of stuff. So, but the other way that I was lucky is that while I was at SRT, um, do you remember enhanced CDs? Of where course, yeah. You would put, yeah, you'd, you'd put a QuickTime video onto the, you'd put a CD-ROM section on the end of a CD so that it could play in a CD player and it could play in a computer. Um, this was before you could have downloadable videos. Um, so we got into enhanced CDs really early on and I, um, you know, because I was had a pretty technical background and was kind of interested in that stuff, volunteered to to do the research on that. So I got into enhanced CDs kind of early on and that led naturally, um, you know, towards in the late 90s to DVD authoring. So um, that led to doing surround sound mixing and mastering for the DVDs. Um, and, you know, so that was an aspect in which I was lucky with the timing. I was lucky with the fact that I was interested in it. Nobody else at SRT at that point really, you know, uh, Nick is a fantastic mastering engineer, but he'd be the first person to tell you he's he's all about the music um, rather than getting into, you know, the kind of the programming, programming aspects and the kind of nitty gritty stuff. And then the last one I would say would be when I left the company in 2010, um, that was to, to get into Blu-ray authoring. Um, I saw an opportunity there and I mean, at the time I didn't understand why SRT didn't want to get into it. Um, unfortunately, about three or four months after I left, the company closed. So hmm. I now know that they just weren't able to at that point. Um, so yeah, I kind of, you know, all of those things added up and just the, the people I've met, the colleagues I've had, you know, it's, you know, there's, there's been lots of hard work, but also great doses of luck along the way, I would say. You know, we have a similar background in that respect because I used to have an office next to Oasis Mastering, which is, you know, one of the bigger mastering houses in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I was running a production office, but I was also into DVD authoring and enhanced CDs. And they would basically give me all of their work that they didn't want to do. So for a long time, I did all the enhanced CDs that came out of Oasis as well as any DVDs. And I was already mixing a lot of surround sound. And I got a lot that's of- how, That's where I yeah. first came across you was with the surround sound. Because uh, do you remember Glenn Meadows mastering web board? Yes, of course. That yeah. really early forum, yeah. um, which I think actually is still there now. Um, I know a while ago, but um, yeah, that was the first time I came across you and you were talking about, I remember you talking about doing surround mixing, putting uh, the four members of a string quartet, each in a separate speaker, and kind of these different experiments, being really creative with using surround sound. And I, I just loved those ideas. Um, so yeah, that's it's funny, we've got quite a lot in common. Well, when I got into it, it was so new in music that really nobody knew how to do it and there were no rules. I mean, it was so early mm. that there were no tools in terms of, uh, there wasn't a monitor control, there was no way to take all six speakers and control them all at the same time, if you can imagine that. And I can, I can. 
And also the fact that we didn't know how to calibrate the speakers when we did have them. And basically it was just learning everything from the ground up. The mixing also was a big part of the experimentation because there's just, you know, after a while you go, okay, the audience point of view is kind of interesting, but I think there's more that we can do with that. Although I have to say, there were some record labels, Warner Brothers is the one in particular that insisted everything had to be from the audience point of view. Insisted. Yeah, that's... See, and I think that's, well, I mean, so I I was almost always working from the audience point of view because most of it was live DVDs. So yeah. you always had, you know, that kind of visual tie-in. Yeah, sure. Um, but the kind of the compromise that I came up with, I would throw stuff like uh, synth pads into the rear. And I found that you could get away with that kind of thing because it would still fold down cleanly. If you didn't mix the front and the back, you wouldn't get any kind of weird cancellation and stuff. And you'd you were given you could do more than just having the audience in the back but yeah it must have been really frustrating if you're just told no you must have audience in the surround band on stage because it's barely surround sound then at all is it i mean yeah, it's, yeah. you get some extra kind of ambience from the feeling of the space maybe um but i mean my experience was that quite often the you know the mic placement of what the audience mics and all the rest of it was kind of pretty random um yeah absolutely. I, did, I did one yeah. which was culture club at the uh royal albert hall their 20th anniversary gig and there were no audience mics whatever <laughs> um so i had to i had to fake it up there were a few stage mics that were mostly dead they were used for soloists so i was automating those panning them to the rear in between songs in order to bring up some kind of ambience oh it was it was crazy i mean it was good fun but it and, and i completely relate to what you're saying about there not being any gear because the the very first surround sound session that I did was actually in Dolby surround, not 5.1. Um, Cause that's another thing I did was, was, you know, Dolby surround can be encoded into a stereo signal. Right. Um, so, uh, so what was it? That was a kind of a 2.1. So, no, not, I can't figure it out. Anyway, it was kind of fake surround sound. Um, but um, yeah, the first session I did with that, you know, the kind of the client came in expecting, me to be able to kind of fly things around his head and i had to explain i don't even have a surround panner you know i didn't get a surround panner until three or four years later when yeah. we got an o2r 96 um because yeah the so so i was kind of i had multiple channels and you were kind of bringing down the the front faders and bringing up the rears to try and create a sense of movement and stuff yeah it was um it's good though that kind of challenge is i love that kind of stuff i love finding out new things and solving problems i used to get a lot of projects in that were mono and stereo, and then they wouldn't have the multi-tracks available, and they'd say, well, okay, make it into surround. And this is before the, I mean, now there's upmix software all over the place that's actually very good, and even before hardware that would do that. So we came up with a method that was pretty interesting, and basically what it was is we'd throw the stereo mix out into the studio. It was a pretty nice studio, and it was pretty spacious. And then we'd throw some mics out there and record the hard surfaces. So record the reflection off, you know, one was a wall and one was uh, some glass. So it would sound distinctly different. And that gave it a different flavor. And there was some magic with this room. So everybody kind of liked it. And I got a lot of work out of that. Although, you know, it was less than less than satisfying because, you know, after a while all you're doing is just playing things back and recording it you know, the, without doing much. Uh, but anyway, it was a fair amount of work, surprisingly enough. Yeah, well, and they used exactly that technique on the recent Beatles um, Ones uh, release, yeah, the, the album with all the number ones on. Yeah. There's a Blu-ray version of that with um, videos for everything and a ton of bonus content. And the surround mixes of that, they took... They put, you know, a pair of 801s in Studio 2, um, played the music back, and they've recorded the ambience of this, the studio and just brought it in. So it's still exactly the original mixes, but the surround information is kind of an atmosphere of what it would be like if you'd been there in the room with them when they were playing. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, it's, I think it's an interesting idea. Somebody did the same thing where they were releasing um, recordings that were originally on gramophone, you know, the wow. way back. Yeah. And there were, there were kind of different uh, philosophies about how you should do that for a modern audience. And we would always 
We'd run it through the de-clicking uh, hardware. Um, we'd take out as much of the hiss as possible. It would become, you know, perfect digital mono. It would get kind of the cleanest possible result. That was the philosophy that I was told to use. Whereas there was another company in the UK who would get the best possible quality gramophone player they could, a really nice room, and they just put the disc on and play it and record the sound of the gramophone player in the room, um, which I think is equally as valid an approach, you know, and it's just kind of, I guess it's just an example of how many different ways there are to, I was going to say slice an egg, but that's not the expression, yeah. is it? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but I think, you know, again, we come down to, there are purists that really want to hear all of the clicks and all the pops and, and you know, the static noise from the record and just feel that's part of it. That's part of the experience. And if you get rid of that, then they feel they're losing the experience. I, that doesn't work for me, but again, there are some purists out there that kind of feel that way, surprisingly enough. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, and it's, it's fascinating finding the balance. And, you know, when, you, when you're working as a pro and you just get this kind of, you know, succession of clients and they all have different expectations and different, um, you know, kind of figuring out what they want and, and helping them get closer, that's, that's, you know, a huge part of the, the enjoyable bit of the job, I think. Let's jump up to the present now. What do you have in your room? What's your signal chain like? Well, see, I don't have a... I have a room. I'm in my room here, but um, it's not a proper mastering studio. It was never intended to be a proper mastering studio. Um, it's what I call my home mastering studio. Um, and actually, anybody who's interested to, to check it out, you can... I, I put up some videos on the website about how I made it. So here, uh, it's incredibly minimal. I mean, I have a, a Mac Pro with... Um, a TC Electronic interface. Um, I have TC Electronic PowerCore 6000, which is the Firewire version of the, the their fantastic System 6000, the hardware thing that I used for years at SRT and has a lot of the same algorithms. Um, and then I have a bunch of plugins. So there's, there's no analog gear at all um, and everything comes in digitally. Um, so any work that I do would say 100% in the box. Um, because you know what happened when I left SRT, the plan was I was going to dry hire their studios for doing my mastering work, um, but the studio fold uh, the the company folded three or four months after that. Um, we couldn't save the studios. I tried to put a bid together to get all of the gear, but um, it went to somebody else. Um, so everything got torn down, um, you know, and suddenly I had no studio to work in. Unfortunately, um, there's another place where I was lucky, which is that. Uh, an ex-colleague of mine had left maybe five years before and set up his own place um, and even had the same monitoring that he had had when he was at SRT. So there was a room I could go in and work in and, you know, know that I could get great results. Um, and, you know, now, I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased with the results I've got in this little room. You know, I think I, I got lucky with this little room because it wasn't designed, it wasn't properly converted. I have some acoustic treatment in here. I, um to, to try and get the best out of it. But I'm just really pleased with the results I've got. Um, and it's, you know, the more I do, the more I think I would like to work here more and more if I can. So, you know, maybe that's that's something to think about for the future. Yeah, but again, the big thing is if you know your room and you know your monitors and you know what you're listening to and you have a good reference point, it really does matter, does it? I mean, you can work anywhere as long as you have that reference point of what works and what doesn't. I think that's right. I think... Um, I mean, you know, there's there's a minimum. There's a kind of a minimum requirement in terms of acoustic treatment in a room, monitoring quality, processing quality. But yeah, providing that it's not nearly as high as everybody thinks it is. And after that, yeah, it's all about experience. And, and I was lucky in terms of reference material because I had worked for 15 years. So I have this back catalog of stuff. I, I know what that stuff should sound like. So I can put that on pretty much anywhere and, and kind of listen to it and, and get an idea of you know, the, the, the pluses and the minuses of the system that I'm looking, listening to and, you know, what what I can rely on and what I can't. Um, and of course, you know, now I'm, I'm helping people with their own mastering on the website. Um, so one of the big challenges for me was to find out a way to help them with that if, if they don't have that, that experience and that kind of reference point. Um, and my advice is always to use reference tracks, you know, to, to take stuff that you know sounds great everywhere else in the world, bring it into your room and whatever that sounds like is what you're working on should sound like, assuming it's in a reasonably similar genre, you know, and yeah, that that's a really powerful tool. 
I want to get to your website in a second, but first, just some more details about when you're working and how you're working. I'm really curious as to what is the most difficult type of music for you to do? So when you get stuff in, everybody kind of has some things that they find easy and they just like, and it feels good to them. And everybody also has some music that they just find difficult. What's difficult for you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, th- I I find rock and heavy metal really challenging as a mastering engineer um, because, I mean, I love them. I was a huge hair metal fan in the in the late 80s and 90s. Um, but because the arrangements tend to be very full, you know, there's there's a huge amount going on, it can make achieving the balance of all of those elements much more challenging and it can make loudness more challenging. You know, I mean, anybody who knows anything about me knows that I am not particularly interested in loudness for its yeah, own sake. Yeah. But nonetheless... One of the things I do every day as part of being a mastering engineer is to make stuff louder, to, to get it into what I consider to be the sweet spot where it's it's loud enough without being too loud. Um, and yeah, that's particularly challenging. You know, if you've got, I mean, the paradox is if you've got a kind of really stripped back, uh, what's that, folk arrangement or a jazz arrangement, you know, where the nice open textures, um, all the rest of it, it's actually quite easy to make that stuff really loud. Um, providing you have some reasonable processing and you're careful about it because there's plenty of space it's when you when everything the frequency spectrum is f- full already and the loudness levels are all right up there um that's when it gets challenging to to bring the whole thing up without causing damage effectively so in terms of genres i think maybe those are some of the most challenging um what's the most but fun it's always what's the most fun I, well, I, I, I am. I have a huge soft spot for kind of electronica, for you know, orbital underworld. Um, so, I, I really love getting a really good piece of of electronic music. Actually, although the other interesting thing is that over the years I have, because I knew nothing about jazz, but for some reason over the years I have ended up working on quite a bit of jazz. I've done most of my recording and mixing was of jazz musicians, and I have really grown to appreciate. Uh, the, the musicianship that's there you know they these guys come in and they will record an album in two days because they're so well rehearsed because they play all the time and the arrangements are so carefully worked out um and yeah that i've really kind of grown to appreciate that i mean i think one of the secrets of the job is you have to find something that you love about everything you work on <laughs> um yeah. the number of times otherwise it's it's really hard to so I guess maybe a different answer to the question you just asked is the most challenging stuff is the stuff that you just can't love for whatever reason, <laughs> whether it be, you know, you, you just, the music, you somehow hate the music or you, you, I don't know, any number of reasons you could dislike something. But I kind of look for a positive aspect in everything that I work on and then I kind of, that's what I kind of latch onto and, and want to bring out because that's what mastering is all about is bringing out the best of what you, you have. Um, the number of times I've kind of got to the end of a day and thought, oh, I knocked that one out of the park. And then you listen to it the following day and you go, yeah, but it's still bad. <laughs> it's, you know, you've made a huge improvement. You have made the best you could of it. But even so, you you know, it's still not kind of like the greatest release ever. Well, okay. Speaking of which then, do you find that mixers make common mistakes that you hear? Yeah. Um, and But it, it, the interesting thing is it changes over time. So probably... Back in the day, when I started out, I would say a lot of the stuff that I got um, actually didn't, they weren't using enough compression in the mix. Um, And probably everything was a bit clean and a little bit characterless. So I would quite often earlier on in my career be using quite a lot of compression, not to make stuff loud, but just to kind of pull the mix together and get that kind of, uh, you know, the slight pumping quality maybe sometimes and just that kind of the sound that everybody expects from the different genres. Whereas these days, I would say it's the exact opposite. Um, if the most common complaint I have is that stuff that comes in has just got too much processing. And my, my kind of bugbear at the moment is all of these saturation and tape emulation and soft clipping kind of, you know, the, the plug-in emulations and stuff. You know, those things are great. And some of them can give you a real flavor of of the real thing that we know from all the classic recordings that we love. 
um, but they just get used to death. Everything, uh, you know, it's just extraordinary. There was one thing where somebody sent something into me, and I, I said, oh, it sounds a little bit maybe overcooked. Did you have anything on the on the stereo bus? You know, maybe you could send me a version with a bit less than that. And they said, oh yeah, we used the, the PSP Vintage Walmart. Um, you know, and they sent me another version. It was unrecognizable. The hmm. difference was, you know, I mean, the level had leapt up by about eight or ten dBs, and it. So I mean, it was useful for me because I had that, I had the the sound that they had achieved in mind when I mastered it. But I went back to the original, and and kind of went in that direction, but not not nearly as hard. Yeah. Um. And I ended up something that that I loved and that they loved, and they, you know, the and actually I, that's that's happened over and over again. I don't think I've ever gone asked somebody to to give me a less uh heavily processed version and then had them ending up wanting to use their original heavily processed version does that make sense yeah yeah, um, yeah i've almost always been able to get i think i think i've literally always been able to get a better result doing similar stuff going for the same goal you know it's all about empathy understanding what they want to achieve and helping them get there um but yeah just doing it more gently, more subtly, um, and you end up with all of the the character that was there original originally, but more space and more clarity and depth and all those things that we want. You know, I found that as well. Where it seems like just because those saturation plugins are available, everyone feels like they have to use them, and there's some sort of myth about the glue that it's adding. And frankly. You know, I go back to the analog tape days, and the glue from analog tape, I think it was something completely overblown. It's not something that I look back to with any kind of fondness, <laughs> honestly. So I certainly agree with you in terms of, um, you know, overdoing those things a lot. Yeah, I, th I think people, everybody now thinks, you know, everybody wants, quotes, analog warmth. Um, and right now it seems to be they think the secret is these plugins that emulate, you know, the sound of pushing tape really hard. Or the, but I think when you go back to those original, there was so much else that went into those recordings, like riding faders, you know, yeah, in yeah. and out of compressors and, and, and better microphone technique and performances and stuff. All of those things contributed a huge amount to the sound that they got. And the tape played a role. But, I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, the, the tape thing makes me laugh because, you know, I've... I've, I've transferred so many analog tapes in, in my career and I've heard, you know, analog tapes that are just the most beautiful things you've ever heard. The, the sound is big and warm and open and spacious and all of those things that we associate with the warm analog sound. And I've heard tapes that just sound cold and hard and brittle and harsh and gritty and nasty. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And then the exact opposite applies. I've heard re digital recordings that go both ways as well. And I, you know, I think the whole analog digital thing is is pretty much a red herring. You know, it's all about how you use the format that you have, not the format that you're using. Before you mentioned about loudness and uh, how you feel that you're trying to get the sweet spot. And unfortunately, record labels seem to be the major culprits here, at least in the States, where they want to squeeze every last one hundredth of a dB out of things and don't even care if it's clipping anymore, From at least from the mastering engineers I speak to over here. And you've railed against that for a long time. As a matter of fact, you started Dynamic Range Day, which my hat's off to you for that. That's pretty fantastic. So well, thank you. what do you feel is the sweet spot? In terms of levels, um, I, in my opinion, if you push any genre so that the loudness level, pretty much however you measure it, is less than eight dBs from the peak level, you're in trouble. So, you know, you can measure people, back when I started out, we measured loudness using a VU meter. Um, most people now know about RMS meters, which are kind of similar to VU meters, but not quite the same. They're a reasonable indication of loudness as well. Now we have this international loudness standard um, that came out of the CARM Act in the US where, you know, there was this need to regulate the, the loudness of adverts on TV. So they had to be able to measure loudness. So they came up with the, the loudness unit, the LU or the LUFS for loudness unit full scale. I mean, if you have something with a balanced EQ, meaning, you know, reasonable, reasonably equal distribution across the frequency range, all of those ways of measuring loudness are going to give you roughly similar results. And I think 
once you push it so that there is less than eight dBs difference between the peak level, digital zero, and the loudness, everything just goes downhill. You need to be careful even pushing it that high, depending on the material. Um, but you know, if, if you're careful and you've got good monitoring, and you know the, the processing these days, there's there's so much more really great stuff that's available affordably these days. It's not impossible to to do this stuff at all. So I my masters, I'm kind of aiming to minus 11, minus 10 when it kind of in general, which I have calibrated to zero on my VU meter because I still, I mean, it's an emulated VU meter these days, not a real VU meter, but I still like to use that way of of keeping an eye on the loudness. And it can, you so you can let it peak kind of one or two dBs into the red. So if you're, if you're, if it's, if zero is minus 10 and you're a couple of dBs above that, that's minus eight, right? Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I just, you know, people keep calling up me up on it. They kind of say, well, isn't it different in different genres? Um, and in my experience, it's not. The The difference between different genres is how much time the music spends at that maximum level, you know? So if you've got a kind of full-on death metal album that's kind of the whole way through, the level is going to be up around minus 10, peaking up to minus 8 most of the time. Whereas if you've got... I don't know, prog rock or or folk or something with a lot more variety, the loudest sections are still going to get up to that same level or can still get up to that same level, but the rest of the time, the levels are probably lower. So, you know, it's... I genuinely think that's a that's a great kind of way of, of judging it. Um, yeah, and, it, I mean, there's there's a ton more information on that if, if people want it. You know what's interesting is if you go to a trade show and you go to a speaker manufacturer... And this could be either pro audio or it could be, you know, hi-fi. It doesn't matter. When the speaker manufacturers use their demo material, it's always material that has a wide dynamic range. And everybody always says when they listen, wow, that sounds so good. That's such a good recording. So we agree on that. But yet when it comes to the record labels and what they want and getting airplay. And I understand that, you know, there's a certain amount that you have to match the level of, of your competitor. Yeah, that's true. But really when it comes down to it, we like dynamic range. We like controlled dynamic range. Let's put it like that. Yeah. We, we like the balance. Yeah. I mean, you know, people often misunderstand me with dynamic range day. You know, they kind of think I'm saying that more dynamics is always better. And that's absolutely, you know, there's absolutely some, uh, just as much of a thing as too much dynamics as too little. You know, if you have too much dynamics in the music, then it's not going to translate well between different systems. Um, if you're listening in the car, then, you know, if you have the chorus set up so it sounds good, you might, the verse might drop down too much. You know, it's all about finding the sweet spot, as I say. But yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. Is that how your Perception plugin came about? Well, Perception is um, kind of. the. I mean, the... It's certainly related to loudness because, the, I mean, the reason that everybody has kind of fallen into this trap of thinking that you always need to be louder and that louder is always better is because up to a point, it's true. If I mean, I did this, uh, I did a demo of this live when I, I went over to L.A. recently and spoke at this uh, event called Audio Bloggers Live set up by Ron and Chris Murphy. And yeah. so I played two versions of the same song to the audience and asked them what they thought the differences were. Um, and people kind of came back and saying, oh, one of them sounds, well, Graham Cochran summed it up by saying that, uh, that one of them just sounded more awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah. people were saying, oh, this one has more bass or it has more treble and this, that. And then I told them that the only difference, literally the only difference between those two pieces of music was that one of them was a dB quieter. <laughs> and that was a demonstration of the way that loudness changes the way we perceive sound. The sound doesn't change, but the way we the way our ears and brains process it changes. And nobody knows why. You know, it might be an evolutionary thing where the the saber-toothed tiger that's breathing down your neck is more important to pay attention to than the one that's over there looking at a herd of gazelles. So our brain kind of prioritizes things that are close to us and louder. Um, we, we don't really know. But it, it is a fact that if you just notch the level up slightly, um, it will sound better to people. And it's it's something that mastering engineers have made use of since forever. But the problem is that only works when you've got clean headroom. You know, I mean, if you push an amp or a set of speakers far enough, eventually they will distort. And in digital, if you push the level too close to zero, it will distort. So at that point, louder stops sounding, 
better. And that's where the whole thing of balance comes in. Now, the, the problem with, I mean, I call this thing the loudness deception, where you're, you're fooled by the loudness into thinking that the sound has changed when it hasn't really. The problem with it is, as a mastering engineer, if you take the client's source and even just make it two or three dBs louder and then compare your before and your after, the risk is that the louder version is going to sound better to you just because it's louder, not because you actually did anything to make it sound better. So one of the things you learn very early on as a, being trained as a mastering engineer is that you have to, before you make your A-B comparison, your before and after, you have to loudness match the, the two. Now, so you know, back in the day, I would do that. You'd go through the whole mastering thing. You'd get, you'd say, okay, here's my, this is what I think it should sound like. And then you'd listen, you'd balance the loudness by ear, and then you'd do your A-B comparison. And you might think, oh, well, now I've matched them. I think maybe I've kind of overcooked the top end slightly or, you know, not quite enough bass or whatever it is. You'd make a tweak and then you'd listen and you'd go, yeah, that's better. And you'd move on. Um, the challenge with that is that balancing loudness is a skill that takes a long time to learn. I mean, that's certainly something that took me more than a year or two to learn to do really, really well. Um, and the idea of perception is that it basically automates the whole thing. So um, you, you, you have your, bef your mastered version and your unmastered version. You put one, p one uh, instance of perception at the beginning of the processing chain. You put one at the end um, and you click a button and it will measure the difference between the two, loudness match them, and then and compensate for any sync errors there might be, any latency. And then you can instantly bypass all of your mastering processing and hear a loudness matched a B comparison with a seamless switch. So you can really hear only the effect of the processing you've done. And then you can hear a really genuine objective, uh, or you can form a really objective opinion on whether what you've done is good or not. So that's where that came from. That's very cool, definitely. Tell me about production advice. How did that come about, your website? Your website and blog and, and your courses, how did that all come about? Production advice actually was an idea that didn't work. The reason that the site is called production advice is that I had this, this was when I was still working as a mastering engineer and the company I was working for didn't really want me to, um, to, to do anything that might conflict with my, with my employment, which made sense. Um, so I thought, well, what else can I can do? And I had this idea that I would offer, if you like, pay as you go, uh, production advice. So for somebody who couldn't necessarily afford to employ a full-time producer on their project, they could come to me whenever they needed it, give me their songs to listen to, and I would give them feedback. They would pay me for the time that I spent, um, and hopefully they would find it beneficial. So that's why I chose the name, and I set the whole website up, and that's what it was all targeted at, and uh, nobody really wanted it as a service, <laughs> um, or certainly not at the prices that I needed to pay to make it worth my while. Um, and I think maybe that's where I slipped up is it just, it took me, you know, it takes a long time to to come back with really helpful, uh, valuable opinions for people on their music. Um, and, you know, I had, I had bills to pay. So, so, so that idea kind of flopped, but along the way I had already had a little blogspot blog where I'd, um, I'd kind of, I'd talked about the, um, Metallica album death magnetic and yeah. the loudness wars and that had that had gone viral so that had got me some attention and so from then on people were always interested in my my views on loudness and uh my my opinions about mastering so uh, you know at the point where i left srt i decided that i would really start talking about mastering more on on the blog and so yeah it's ironic that this this website called production advice it, i spend probably 80 or 90 percent of my time talking about mastering um <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very happy about that because I mean it's you know that's the subject I'm I'm really passionate about yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know if, if I can give people information that's useful then I'm I'm very happy to do that and then the, everything else just kind of grew out of that really um, well so another kind of I don't know what I'd call this lucky in hindsight but another thing that happened was that about a year after I set up my own company to explore the whole Blu-ray option uh, that was very successful for about a year and then I lost my major client. Um, and suddenly I was kind of, you know, watching the the money trickle away and looking around for other work. And that's when I did the first ebook, uh, which was on using multiband compression, mm -hmm. um, which was just a topic that people kept asking me about and that kind of needed more than a couple of blog posts to kind of really go into. 
Um, so I put that together and I kind of put it out and crossed my fingers. And luckily, you know, people love that. I got really good feedback on it. And so I've just kind of moved on from from there. Um, and I set up, you know, this the, the course, the Home Mastering Masterclass course, which is a, an eight-week course for, for people who are interested in mastering their own music. Um, and then I've got into the plugins. There's Perception. There's now the Dynameter plugin. Um, yeah, and I'm just kind of I'm following what I what I hope people need. I mean, you have Perception new, and you have Dynameter. A new, you have a new podcast too, right? You're absolutely right. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, I yeah. just started. Where, where are we up to? We're in week, uh, I think week nine comes out this week. Um, yeah, so Steve Cherubino, who you know. Yeah. Um, he's, the reason why, to, to get... he's the reason why I do my podcast. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't be here so, now, Ian. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's the same. From, well, I, no, I wouldn't be here now, and I wouldn't be doing my own podcast if it wasn't for Steve, because he encouraged me to... Uh, to get started with the mastering i'd wanted to do a podcast for, for ages it was something that i i thought people would like and that i mean i actually it's very time consuming i find to to do blog posts and to do youtube videos um and one of the things i like about the, the podcast is you, you know you can just you talk and you rattle through a subject and you kind of edit a few bits here and there and i'm kind of hoping that i'll be able to be more put more content out more regularly in that way without having too huge an impact on the having to do work for people and yeah. that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Um, well, we could keep on talking for another hour, I think, because I have a lot to ask you, but I don't want to take up too much of your time here. One last question, though. What's the best piece of business advice that you either learned along the way or maybe somebody imparted to you? I think the the one for me is you need to be passionate about what you do. Um, there was actually... I just mentioned when the, I lost that major Blu-ray client, um, and that was a really tough time for me um, because I didn't have this room at that point. I didn't have any way of of doing mastering work, um, and I actually I got quite depressed about it. And I got into a fight online with, with a guy called Tony, who he just caught me on a bad day, and he. I said something about, he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing some Blu-ray authoring. And he was, he said, what, no mastering? And I was like, no, I have to pay the bills. I have to, you know, uh, you don't understand what it's like. And he kind of said, oh, whoa, sorry. I'm, you know, I, I apologize. I, I just meant it seems like, you know, a waste of, of your skills. Um, and and I, I kind of, you know, again, I, I kind of shouted at him. And, and with hindsight, I realized that was more about me and how I was feeling than what he was saying. But he said, he said, look, stop worrying about it. He said, you could do a better job mastering on headphones than most people could in the best studio in the world. And I was, yeah, yeah, and just kind of got on. But then funnily enough, about a week later, um, the guy who runs the studio that I was using at the time sent me a mix over to because he's recording and mixing and, and said, you know, what do you think of this? Just, just getting my opinion. And I kind of listened to it and I said, well, I think the mix sounds great, um, you know, and I'm, I'm just listening on headphones, but I actually think in terms of the mastering, you could try doing this, this, and this, but ignore me because I'm just listening on headphones. And he sent me this email going back saying, oh, you're right. You know, he's like, damn you. <laughs> um, he's like, I hate you. You always do that to me. And those two things kind of locked together in my head. And I sort of thought, actually, maybe I can, you know, do, maybe I don't need to have a full-blown $100,000 studio in order to be able to use the skills and the instincts that I have and that I've built up over the years. And, you know, it wasn't an overnight thing, but from there on, I suddenly started focusing back on the mastering. I'm doing less and less of the Blu-ray and DVD stuff. And and as soon as I did that, everything kind of turned, everything started to click. You know, that's when the ebook came. And that's when I started writing about the stuff that I really cared about on the website. And I just, I think that that change of focus because prior to that I had been very very busy I'd been making a living everything was fine but I'd been really stressed and actually pretty unhappy and I with hindsight I think quite a lot of that was because I wasn't doing the thing where my passion really lay um so yeah it kind of sounds a bit woo woo and new age and stuff but I you know you need to be careful because if you you know, lots of people say, oh, you should do what you love. And there is a risk that if you do the thing that you love as a career, you might accidentally kill it. But that's not my experience. You know, I've found 
whatever I do, whenever I go for the thing that really gets me excited, that really gets me, that I'm really interested in, that's when the success comes. Those, you know, those are the blog posts that people respond to. Those are the videos that um, people love. And, you know, those are the albums that are a, a huge success is the ones where it's all just, you know, about enthusiasm and the, the joy of what you do. So, yeah, that's, that's my... I absolutely agree with you. I mean, that's been a, my experience as well. So, uh, you know, I certainly empathize. Ian, thanks so much for your time. I really had a lot of fun talking to you. I hope we can do this again because we're just we're just scratching the surface here as far as I'm concerned. So much more we can my talk My pleasure. About. Yeah, absolutely. To find out more about Ian, his courses, the Perception plugin, and his podcast, go to productionadvice.co. Dot UK. That's production advice, all one word, dot co, dot UK. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyoinnercircle.com or find it in iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, and Google Play. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyowinnercircle.com, you'll find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time 